forward to you guys getting downright Pentecostal out there today. It's all right. There is, uh, there is, there is an outpouring of God's presence and spirit coming on this earth to God's people. Do you believe that? Do you believe God is pouring himself out on his people? And uh, we've been through some tough times. 2020 has been tough, right? Anybody? Amen? Different. God's doing something. He's purifying. He's shaping us. He's getting us in a place to get us ready for what he's going to do next. So I'm excited about that. Really am. Good to see you today. Today we're in our series, Jesus Uncut and Unedited. And we're talking today about what Jesus says about vengeance. What Jesus says about getting even with those who hurt you, insult you, or cheat you. Now I've got to be honest with you. I like getting even. I like to see people get what's coming to them. I love it when somebody speeds by me on the interstate and cuts me off, and then they go right by a trooper, and the blue lights come on. Have that ever happened to you? That happened to me one day on 26. I'm on the way to church, and this car comes by me going about 95, about runs me off the road, and just about the time they get by me, they went by one of our deputy sheriffs, who I knew, who sits there a lot, and I'm like, go get him, yes! There are videos on YouTube you can watch, and they're called Instant Justice, and they show a lot of stuff like that. Somebody cuts somebody off in traffic right in front of a cop, and the blue lights come on, and it's just deliciously wonderful. We like getting even. I like a good revenge story even. Heard about a guy, he was away serving, the, serving his country in the military, and his fiance sent him a letter to break up with him. And it was just not even nice the way she did it. She said, you know, you're just not good looking enough for me. You don't have enough money. I found a guy who's better looking, who has more money, and he's here. Our engagement's off. And she added insult to injury, or injury to insult by saying, uh, whichever it is. (laughs) Is it insult to injury? or We got to figure that out before we go on. No. She made it worse. How's that? She made it worse by saying at the end of it, send me back my picture. You've got to picture me, mail it back to me. So he's brokenhearted. He's got about 20 buddies in his unit, and they decide they're going to get her back. So they all gather pictures of their girlfriends, and they give him about 20 pictures. He puts it in an envelope, sends back a letter saying, no sweat, we're broken up, I get it, no problem. I've just forgotten which one of these you are. If you would, just take, just take your picture out and send the rest back to me. Isn't that awesome? We probably should not be clapping for that, but we're just taking a minute to get in the flesh here. What I'm doing is I'm priming you so I can really get on you with the rest of this message. I'm setting you up here. Really, I'm just being honest. In our human nature, in our flesh, we like vengeance. We like getting even. You ever seen a Clint Eastwood movie? Awesome actor, but built a career on movies where somebody does something bad to somebody really innocent at the start. And the rest of the movie, you're just waiting on the bad guy to get what's coming to him. One of my favorite revenge movie lines is this, go ahead, make my day. Some of you have seen Dirty Harry, right? My other favorite, and this is just me, but anybody seen The Princess Bride? My favorite revenge movie quote is, My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Enough of you knew that. That's my, if you haven't seen The Princess Bride, uh, I don't know if you should or not, but it's fine. The problem is, I, want, I like to say I want justice, but I want justice for the other person. I want mercy for me. I want you to get what's coming to you but I don't want to get what's coming to me, right? What really truth, I want to pay people back when they hurt me. Jesus had something to say about this. This series is about when Jesus said, you've heard this, but I say this to you. Matthew five thirty eight. he talks about through 42, he talks about vengeance. And this is what he said. You've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is called the lex talionis. It's an old law from the Old Testament, from three different books in the Old Testament. And it was actually a very merciful law. But because in the Old Testament, if you injured somebody or insulted somebody, they might kill you. 
The Old Testament was written to a very brutal culture, a very uh, warrior culture. And they had, I mean, they would go to extreme measures to inflict vengeance on someone. So the statement, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, was actually a step towards mercy. They're saying, if somebody gouges out your eye, don't kill them, just put their eye out. If they knock out your tooth, just knock out one tooth, not their whole mouth. So it's actually a good statement in the right direction, but Jesus, as He did six times in this passage, took it even further and drove the message home in a way that's absolutely uncomfortable. I'm going to tell you, the rest of this message today is not going to make you feel good. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable, I think. It's going to be something you're not going to like that much, and it's hard for a preacher to bring a message that you're worried people won't like. But when I was a kid, my dad told me to do something one time. He gave me an order, and he said, go do this. And I said, Dad, I don't like it. He said, well, you don't have to like it. You don't have to like it. You just have to obey it. Now, before I jump into this and you get upset about it, I want you to understand. I I know you're not going to get as upset as I'm making this out to be, but this is written in red, which means it comes straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to follow Jesus. If we're going to be disciples of Christ and name His name, we've got to live it out. And this is some very serious and very difficult to receive uh, words about vengeance today. He said this in verse 39, You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I say, do not resist an evil person. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that I should give up my right to defend myself, that I should just sit back and let someone come and kill me and my family? I don't believe that's that extreme. No, I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't retaliate with evil. Don't repay evil with more evil. And I want you to keep this in mind as we speak through this message. What Jesus is talking about in this passage is personal vengeance. He does not mean that people should not be held accountable for hurting other people by the community. I appreciate our law enforcement. Don't you? Don't you appreciate law enforcement, first responders, people who serve? I mean, there are people all the time who are out there serving. I'm a chaplain with the Henderson County Sheriff's Department. Love those men and women and all they do so much for us. I love our military. I love our people who stand up for freedom. Don't you? I'm yes. thankful for that. I'll always be that. I'll always be a patriot. I love my country, right? They're catching a lot of heat right now, but I'm thankful for the fact that they have been invested with authority by the people. Yes. I tell them this often. The people of Henderson County have invested our sheriff with authority, and you've been vested with the authority that's been put in him. So when you go out today to stand up for the righteous law, you are doing the Lord's work, and I want you to know we're behind you, we're with you, and God is with you, right? Yes. Amen. 99.9% of the law enforcement people that I know are, are good people who got into what they're doing to serve people and to love people. There's some... Bad people in every profession, but we should not let them define everybody else. Do you understand that? So there is a place, there is a place for a community as a whole to punish crime. When someone commits murder, they should pay for that crime and they should be placed somewhere where they can't do it again. But what Jesus is talking about here is us as individuals exacting vengeance on someone else for what they've done to us personally personally bringing out vengeance. He said this, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. I don't like that. (laughs) Now, primarily here, he's not talking about a physical assault. He's talking about a personal insult. See, slapping someone on the cheek in this day, the day of the hearers, was one of the ultimate forms of insult. They would typically do it like a backhand thing. They would slap you backhanded on the cheek, not to hurt you, but to insult you and to show their contempt for you. Now, I don't know about the rest of you. I bet I know about most of you. When you get slapped on the cheek, your first instinct is not to hug that person and pray for them. Your first instinct is to pop them right back just like they did you. In fact, hit them harder, right? Amen. <laughs> Somebody slaps me, slaps me on the cheek. I want to get them with a fist. 
But Jesus said, don't do that. He said, off from the other cheek also. How can he say that? How can Jesus say that I should not retaliate against a personal insult? I'm going to tell you, as, as people, as human beings, we, we bristle under insults. We want to settle the score. We want to get even with those people. But here's the victory in this. When you understand who you are in Jesus Christ and who He made you to be, you know that nothing that anybody says about you can destroy that. And you are secure enough in that that you don't have to stop and fight back. You can simply smile and walk on knowing who you are in Jesus Christ without lowering yourself to their level. Right? When you, when you slap them back, you're no better than they are. I love this. Uh, I heard a quote the other day. It said, a lion doesn't even turn and look at a barking dog. <laughs> when you know you're a lion and some yapping little puppy calls you a name, you don't even have to turn and look at it because you know who you are in Jesus Christ. And that insult didn't hurt you. Yes, you can simply turn cheek and walk on. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. You don't respond. Yes. Now, Jesus goes further. And I think as this passage goes on, they get a little bit harder to deal with. He said this. He said, Matthew 5, 40, If you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If they give, get your shirt in court, give them your coat. Now, wait a minute. This is equivalent to saying is someone sues me, takes me to court, and cheats me out of money, I should invite them out to a steak dinner. See, in the, in the law of the day, your coat was actually protected by law. You're, you had the inner shirt, and you had a coat like we do today. And a person's coat was much, very important to them in the day. You could actually go and tell somebody, I'm going to pay you back this afternoon. Hold my coat until I come back. You could deposit your coat for security on an agreement. But the law said that coat had to be returned to every individual before nightfall because they often slept in their coat. They used it as a sleeping bag. It was a measure to keep warm. So the law said you couldn't take a person's coat away. But Jesus comes along and says, if they sue you and take your shirt, offer them your coat too. Wait a minute. I just got cheated out of money and I ought to bless that person on top of the way they cheated me? What? I remind you, it's written in red. What does it mean? Well, see, I realize that an insult cannot take away from my identity. I realize that someone cheating me cannot really take away from anything that I own. None of this belongs to me. This is just something God has placed in my hands temporarily. And one day this body's going to go back to dust. My spirit's going to go to be with Jesus. And none of this will matter it for anything. It all belongs to Him. And when somebody cheats me, it's still His. Oh, some of you don't like that. And I don't like it either. Because I want to hold on to what's mine. I've got rights and I want to protect my rights. This is mine and they took it away from me wrongly. And I've just got to settle the score. I've seen a couple kinds of people. There are people who have an injustice perpetrated against them. And they carry it for the rest of their lives. Maybe somebody stole money from them. And they can tell you to the penny how much that person owes them. And every time they see that person, they're like, oh, cheated me. There are other people who say, well, that's what happened. It's terrible. But I'm going to deal with it. Then I'm going to forget about it. And I'm going to live my life in freedom. You can stand up for your rights the rest of your life and be in bondage. Or you can just leave it with Jesus and be free. Yes. You can say, Jesus, this is yours. Yes. 
This injustice is yours. This wrong that was perpetrated against me, it's yours. I'm going to still be able to bless that person. Jesus said, bless those who curse you. Number one, you bless those who curse you because they're going to need it. Because when they're messing with God's people, they're messing with God. But there's something deeper at work here. When you bless someone that's done you wrong, something happens in your heart that's worth more to you than the money you got cheated out of. Oh, come on. Can I get an amen here? What happens in your heart when you keep your heart open to people even when you've been hurt? Does that mean you do business with them again? No. Does that mean you put yourself out there that you commit to something again? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying have the heart to be able to bless them even though they did you wrong. Can we live that out? Can we obey Jesus in that? I'm going to tell you at the end of this message, He's going to give you some opportunities to obey here. They're not going to be easy, but they're going to be liberating for you. Now, He goes on. This one's tough for them especially. Matthew 5, 41, He said, If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Now, this really hurt their feelings. You see, the nation of Israel in their day was looking for a Messiah to come mainly to get Rome off their backs. If you will read the Gospels, you will see again and again and again that they were trying to make Jesus to be a political revolutionary rather than a spiritual savior. I'm going to say that again. Because I don't think you got how good that was. They were trying to pull Jesus into being a political revolutionary to throw the Romans' oppression off their backs rather than dealing with their problem of sin and death. Jesus didn't come to set them free from the Romans. Jesus didn't come to do a political work. He came to set them free from sin and death. He didn't come to just solve a temporary problem. He came to solve an eternity problem. Yes, yes. He dealt with their issues so they could rise above any sort of political oppression. Amen. Do I need to say that again too? When you're free in Jesus, what's going around, on around you doesn't take away what's already happened inside of you. Amen. Amen. They hated the Romans. There was actually a law that said if a Roman soldier came up to you and compelled you to carry his gear for a mile, you had to do it. You had to go a mile. You could quit at a mile. They graded under that. The Romans, oppressive Romans. I was on my way to work the other day, and a soldier stopped me, and I had to carry his stuff for a mile. Then I had to come back a mile. cost me an hour. Why doesn't Jesus do something about this? And you know how they were. They measured that mile out. One mile. Romans. Jesus says, go two miles. What? I am sure Jesus had a church split when he said that. People think all the time Jesus just kept gaining people. There are many times Jesus said something and people's like, I'm out of here. This is one of them. What in the world? Serve the Romans and go an extra mile. You know, by the way, this is where we get the phrase going the extra mile. It comes from this passage. What does it mean to go the extra mile? It means to go above and beyond for somebody and serve them in an extravagant way. One of our values at Upward Christian Fellowship is radical generosity. That means we give far beyond what anyone would expect us to. Amen. We love to give and surprise people. Yes. And we love to give people to people that a church has never given to them before. Yes. Amen. We love it when we take an offering to somebody and they say, What? A church? 
Because that's what the church ought to be. Yes. Amen? Yes. You guys were so generous throughout the pandemic that we were able to bless businesses and help them stay alive and stay afloat. That's what the people of God did in our community. Do you hear that? That's going the extra mile. Were they all Christian businesses? Nope. Can we support people who don't follow? Yes. Yes, Because we win them by showing them the heart of Jesus. Amen. 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 I heard a story the other day about the extra mile. This CEO went into a restaurant. He ran a huge company, hired people all the time. He goes into a restaurant, sits down, and the server comes up, and he said, "Uh, I'll have a Diet Coke. And she said, we only have Diet Pepsi. He's like, okay, I guess I can deal with that. She went away to bring back the drink, and she was gone a little longer than he thought she normally would have been. And uh, she had a cup of ice and a can of Diet Coke. And he said, I thought you just had Diet Pepsi. She said, well, we do, but I just knew you wanted a Diet Coke. He said, how'd you get that? She said, well, there's a little grocery store across the street. She left work, took her own money, brought him back a Diet Coke, and served it to him. He said, that's amazing. Can I hire you? He said, you don't work here anymore. You got a job in my company anytime you want it. And you'll love it, and it'll pay you more than you're making here. Going the extra mile gets rewarded. But Jesus here is talking about going the extra mile to serve someone that you don't like. There's more blessing in it for you and for everybody when you bless someone that you don't like. You don't hear Joyce. Joyce said, that's hard, but amen. (laughs) I'm with you, Joyce. It's hard, but amen. I struggle with this all week. I fought with the Lord over this all week and said, God, how can we do? That's just Jesus. And he told me, you don't have to like it. You just have to do it. You just obey. But when you do, it becomes so much fun. It really does. When you bless someone that's cursed you, something happens in your heart that sets you free and you no longer carry that offense anymore in your life and you're just free to live for Jesus. Then he says this, Matthew 5, 42, give to those who ask. Give to those who ask. When someone asks you for help, help them. It doesn't say qualify them. It doesn't say figure out if they deserve it or not. Now, I understand, and I get this. When you help somebody, you want to help them. So if someone, let's say, is struggling with a drug addiction, it's not a good idea to hand them cash for them to go buy drugs. But you can buy them food. I don't care what anybody's done. I don't want to see them starve. I don't care how bad they are. I don't want to see them freeze to death. Are you with me? But I hear people say things like this. I want to give to some deserving person. What if Jesus had said that? Where would you and I be? I don't know about y'all, but I I didn't magically become deserving when he saved me. He saved me when I was a lost sinner running away from him. Amen? Give to those who ask. It's a blessing to give. You need to show your kids how to be generous. I was in Burger King one day, and my children were in there, and we were eating a Whopper. Praise the Lord. And this guy came in, and uh, he had a story, and he needed help. And um, he said that, and this is a common story. We hear this all the time. So it's a common story by people who aren't necessarily telling the truth. They'll say, Uh, I'm trying to get somewhere out of town, and my car broke down, and I'm in a problem, and I'm trying to get there. And I just knew that story was just totally made up, you know. I I could tell. I've heard that story so many times. But my kids were watching. And I said, yeah, he's probably lying, but if he's hungry, I want to help him. And if... 
I don't want my kids to see me closing up my heart to somebody. I want them to see me being generous. So I said in front of them, I said, okay, just go up and whatever you want to order, order it. He said, <laughs> he went up there and ordered three triple whoppers. He wasn't easy on me. He had somebody in the car. I never knew two people could spend so much money at Burger King. <laughs> but you know what? My kids didn't forget that. They're going to be somewhere someday and somebody needs help. And they're going to open their heart. Say, you might get cheated. You will get cheated. But it's okay. Can I tell you something that might set you free? It's not the end of the world when you get cheated. You'll be okay. God will bless you. He'll take care of you. And it all belongs to Him anyway. What you and I have to do is obey Jesus and keep our heart right. Give to those who ask. And when someone needs to borrow, let someone borrow. Now there's a way to do this wisely. There's a way to do this that helps people. But the underlying message is keep an open heart to people in need, especially those who have wronged you. What's the application here? We're going to quit here in just about two hours. Um, (laughs) Here's the application. Am I going to stand up for my rights Or am I going to place my rights on the cross with Jesus Christ and allow God to control my destiny? Am I going to just surrender my rights to Jesus and let God take care of me? Or am I going to fight for what's mine? Here's what we do as Christians. Here's the application of this. When they insult us, we bear it with dignity. We don't fight back. We have nothing to prove. We don't have to win the argument. We don't have to defend ourselves. We can just bear an insult with dignity. Secondly, when they persecute us, we serve them. When they persecute, we serve them. I heard about a church recently. Cool story just this morning. I heard about a church recently. The pastor was preaching on a biblical view of sexuality, which we stand for as well. And we've had some minor persecution for that. This pastor was doing a series on it. And, and a group of people who really disagreed with it came out and protested on the front lawn of the church. And they were carrying signs. They were yelling at people as they come in. They said the church was filled with hate and all those things. And uh, they came and asked the leadership, what should we do? And the pastor said, uh, it's cold out there. Serve them some coffee. So they actually served coffee to the protesters. What is so cool about that is I preached this message at 930 and I told that service. Somebody was here at 930 that goes to that church. And she said, I was there that Sunday morning and I remember when that happened. And, and the better part of it is many of the protesters came to the second worship service and were there Listening. Amen. Awesome. Can anybody say yes? Yes. yes? Can anybody give me a big Ric Flair? Woo! Woo! You people always respond to that. If I want to get something out of you, just mention Ric Flair, and there you go. That's a win for the kingdom, right? When they persecute us, we serve them. When they take advantage of us, we go the extra mile with them. And when they ask for help, we bless them. Here's a statement I don't want you to forget. The priority of my life should be serving others, not standing up for my rights. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave up his rights even to live. And in doing so, he served the world. You want to talk about an ironic thing. The Messiah that they thought was going to kick Rome out actually allowed himself to be executed by Rome. He didn't do it. He wasn't a victim. He did it willingly. He willingly gave up his rights. He never became a victim. Do you realize Jesus could have wiped up the floor with all the Romans? When they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they said, Jesus said, who are you looking for? They said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And one of the gospel writers said, when he said that, they all fell to the ground. Just the word of his mouth was so powerful, it knocked them to the ground. Boom. He could have killed them all. 
He willingly put his hands on that cross and let them do this, all the while saying, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. Our Savior, the founder of our faith, the one that we follow, he gave up his rights in service to others. We should do the same. We should make life about serving, not about clinging to what we perceive to be our rights. Have I hung my rights on the cross of Jesus and left them there? Is the kingdom of God more important than my personal comfort and success? Let me ask you, who won? Rome or Jesus? He gave his life, hung on a Roman cross by Roman soldiers. 300 years after his death, the Roman emperor Constantine became a Christian. People all over Rome became Christian. Now, they made some mistakes. They tried to make Christianity a state religion. Bad idea. Never works. But Rome converted to Christianity just 300 years after he was gone. Jesus conquered by serving. He didn't conquer by demanding his rights. He conquered by releasing his rights to God and serving people. Man, we got problems in our world, don't we? Have we got problems in our world? And they keep turning up the anger level, and they want us to turn it up too. We don't. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And repaying kind in kind will not win this battle. You know what will win it? Selfless sacrifice and service, even to people who disagree with us. That's how we're going to win this battle. When we're insulted, when they try to get us to raise the level of the conversation, we stay with Jesus and we serve them in love and we demonstrate the heart of our Savior to them. You've been watching the news lately? If so, why? Why? I think there are a group of us out there who are just sick of hearing all of it. Can I get an amen? I'm sick of hearing either side bicker and fight like a bunch of kindergartners, aren't you? And I think uh, it really ticks them off that we're not scared. It really ticks them off that we're not upset about the latest crisis. There are those out there who want to steal our joy all the time, and they really don't like the fact that we're still so happy. Amen. Because you see, we're free. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. I want the country to go a certain direction, but if it doesn't, I'm still serving Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. I may, and you may be persecuted. But that still can't steal from what I've got in my heart. It can't take away everything I am and everything he's given me. That's safe with him today. Do you hear me today? Amen. I believe in standing up for what you believe. If you don't think that, come to church in October and you're going to hear me make people mad all over the place. I'm going to be standing up for some things that are kingdom principles that people are trying to inject into a political party today and say this is right or this or left. I'm not really worried about what's right and what's left. I'm worried about what's kingdom and what's not. And there's some things where the kingdom intersects with politics, and we've got to be willing to speak up on those issues for the kingdom. We're going to do that in October. So get ready. But we've got issues. I like that. That was a trailer, wasn't it? Perfect. <laughs> we've got issues. I heard of a, an African-American evangelist who Jesus saved him out of a gang in New York City. He's a tough guy, accustomed to gang violence. And he heard the gospel and came to Jesus. And Jesus changed his whole life. And he began to tell people about Jesus. Just a couple of weeks after he got saved, he was playing in a football game. And uh, he blocked this white guy and made him mad. And the white guy threw him down on the ground, stomped on his back, and called him all kinds of racial slurs, just terrible. Just insulted him terribly. And there's no place for that. Certainly not in the church. And it ought to be out of the world. It's our job to shine a light and make that happen. The guy's name was Tom, Tom Skinner, the evangelist. He said, I got started to get up off the ground and be the old Tom. 
He said, but I got up and what came out of my mouth surprised me. Jesus will just jump out of you sometimes and surprise you. And he said, I looked at the guy and said, because of Jesus, I love you anyway. God didn't know what to do with it. The game went on. They finished the game. And after the game, this guy comes up to Tom and says, listen, you did more to knock prejudice out of me than anybody's ever done in my life. He said, you could have busted me in the jaw and not hit me any harder. What did he do? He conquered by serving. He conquered by loving. That's how we conquer as a church, by serving. Now, are you ready? Are you ready to live this out this week? You're not so sure, are you? Neither am I. But I want to say yes to Jesus. First of all, if you're not serving Jesus and following Him, you need to say yes to Him today as your Lord and Savior. That's the greatest thing you can do. If you are, you can't just walk away from this Word. Let me tell you, you came this morning, you heard the Word, you don't get the freedom just to walk away and say that's a good sermon because God's going to hold you accountable for it. If you hear it, He holds you accountable for it. You watch it online, you tuned in today, guess what? You're accountable now. We love you. you got to live it. Here's how He's going to challenge you to do it. Are you ready for this? God's going to give you an opportunity to do this. I really prayed over this. Here's what we're going to get a chance to do. Number one, we're going to be insulted. And we're going to bear it with dignity because of who we are in Jesus. Amen. Anybody ready for that? There's three of them. And I was bargaining with God this week and said, God, do we have to do all three this week? That was supposed to be funny. I was just saying, God, can I just pick one this week? We're going to let an insult pass. We're going to bless somebody who doesn't deserve it. Then we're going to go the extra mile to serve somebody. Somebody's going to need help. And we're going to help them and then some. Amen? You ready? Anybody ready to do that? How many are going to say, yes, Lord, give me an opportunity and help me obey it this week? How many would just say, God, give me the chance? Now, you know what you're asking for? You're asking for somebody to insult you this week. You're asking for some undeserving people to be around this week. And you're asking for somebody to ask for help this week. You still with me? Let me check the hands again. Are they still as me? All right. (laughs) Make it so, Lord. Make it happen, Lord. Let's bow our heads together. If anybody's here today and you say, I've never served Jesus with my heart and my life. I've never surrendered to him. But today I want to say yes to him as the Savior and Lord of my life. He died on the cross to set you and I free. You may be watching online. Today's your day. If you're here in the congregation, we won't embarrass you. Can I just see your hand today? If you would raise it up where I can see it, say, Pastor, today I'm saying yes to Jesus. Are you here this morning? Who's here this morning? Anybody? Raise your hand up quickly. Anybody watching online this morning, there's a button you can click and say yes to Jesus there, and we will connect with you and help you on your journey there. Let's give God praise today for people saying yes to Him. If you're saying yes to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus? Thank you for loving me. I ask you today, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. And I'll follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Don't you love that? Don't you love people saying yes to Jesus and surrendering to Him? As I said, I really believe with all my heart, God is going to pour out His Spirit on His people uh, two weeks from today in September. I told you about October. In September, we're going to do a series called Send the Rain. We're going to be talking about Elijah on Mount Carmel. If you're familiar with that story, I believe God's going to send rain on his people in form of blessing, in form of spiritual power. Elijah went up on a hill, and the people built an altar to Baal. And there's a lot of altars being built in our land today to things that are not God and false gods. But as the people of God, we got to build up an altar ourselves, a place of worship on which God can pour himself out in a mighty way. And I believe that. We're going to build an altar, a place of worship, 
right here in our community. And God's going to pour out His Spirit. So we're going to be talking about send the rain in September. So please be in prayer with that. I bless you today with radical generosity. You're part of this family. You're part of this house. That value is going to be all over you. You're going to give and then beyond. You're going to bless with no expectation of return. You're just going to live with an open heart and an open hand to bless and love people around you. I bless you with that heart today in Jesus. Now, I commission you to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the empowerment of the Spirit. Take Jesus to your world. Do it this week. Amen. Be who you are in Jesus. We'll see you back next time. Amen. Bring somebody back with you. Love y'all. Thank you so much.